Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And uh, thank you and welcome uh, to the Telerik R1 2020 release webinar. We're excited. Uh, it's a brand new year, a uh, new decade. Uh, so we're excited. My name is Sam Basu, um, and you are? I'm Ed Charbonneau. All right, so we are both developer advocates here at Progress Software, uh, focusing mostly on the Telerik uh, side of the family today. Uh, so we have a lot to unpack. Uh, we are actually live from our uh, global headquarters out here in Boston. Uh, it's a beautiful day and a lot to unpack over the next uh, hour, hour and a half. And we thank you uh, for taking the time out uh, to join us. So uh, let's talk about what we are going to do over the next uh, hour and a half. Like I said, a lot to unpack. We are looking at the DevCraft uh, suite, which is probably two dozen or so. Uh, different products, different technologies. That's so quite a bit in there. Yeah, so we're going to try to um, do justice. Uh, we're going to do first half of 45 minutes, mostly with the web stuff, because that's all the excitement with Blazor and all the cool things with web. So that's going to be Ed. And then we're going to take a quick break. Uh, there's going to be a couple of polls uh, in between. And then I'm going to come back on for the remainder uh, of the 45 minutes to do mobile, desktop, and productivity. So it's going to be busy, uh, lots to unpack. Our teams have been super busy uh, over the last three months, so we have a lot uh, to cover for the R1 release. Yep. yep. All right, so uh, this is your hour. You're joining us, uh, so let's please make this interactive. Uh, you see only the two of us here, uh, but we have a, a good army uh, uh, to help us out. Uh, so there are product owners, there are engineers who are live on the call with us, so please ask questions. So you should see a question answer panel um, in the webinar window. Uh, you can ask there, or if you're on Twitter, if you want to leave a breadcrumb so we can get back to you and have more of a conversation, please use the hashtag uh, HeyTelerik so we can answer your questions, uh, both live as well as uh, following up on it. Also, if in the middle of the next hour and a half, if anything happens, if your audio video cuts out, please let us know so we can uh, help out. If you have to run for a meeting or whatever, uh, please don't worry. We are trying to record this uh, in high def, so we'll put this up as soon as we can. So uh, you'll have uh, something to go back on and, and look at all the things that we are covering. And that's going to be on our YouTube channel. All right, so we are going to talk about all things .NET today. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. a lot of excitement for developers. Uh, the Telerik uh, side of the family is mostly about equipping .NET developers to do the best we can, no matter what type of app you're building. Uh, and again, just a couple of quick reminders: like .NET is uh, not the same .NET as we knew five, not ten years back. Uh, you can really target just about any platform, uh, and this is the .NET that we are looking at uh, right now. Uh, you have .NET Framework, you have .NET Core, you have Mono. Uh, but uh, the tools of our trade have really evolved. So we can really use any type of ID that we want across Windows and Mac. Uh, and uh, you might say there's a little bit of fragmentation. So this is actually the year, 2020, when uh, we are going to see the new evolved .NET. That's .NET 5. Yep. And uh, this is going to come uh, out probably later on uh, in, towards like the end of the year. And this is exciting. We are keeping a close eye out on it. Uh, we are working with Microsoft. Uh, and essentially, this will be a unified platform all of the tooling from us that you expect will just keep on working across web, desktop, and mobile. But it will be nice to have one runtime, maybe with switchable uh, uh, framework pieces underneath, but it'll be one .NET yeah, going we forward. Should, we should be seeing previews this spring. Mm -hmm. And then in fall, we should see a release of .NET 5. Yeah. So that'll yeah. be exciting stuff. Exciting times coming up for .NET developers. OK, so let's talk about our stuff. Uh, again, uh, two main things that we do. We make a lot of tools for developers. We are invested in your success. But again, the Telerik tools are for all things .NET. Again, web, desktop, mobile, reporting, you name it, uh, for any app, any platform. So this is the Telerik webinar uh, to cover our R1 release in 2020. And we also have Kendo UI, which is all of our web tooling, uh, all JavaScript, and again, bring your framework with Angular, uh, React, uh, and jQuery. So again, we will have a dedicated Kendo UI webinar. I think Ed's got a slide that's coming up this Thursday. Uh, so again, <coughs> lots of love to share between web uh, and desktop and mobile. Uh, Throughout uh, our kind of releases, we kind of uh, start uh, seeing a theme of what we want to do every release. We always want to be pushing the envelope. We want to be future facing. Uh, we want to also not leave any apps behind. So if you're doing uh, any desktop development, don't let anybody tell you those are legacy because that's running your business. Uh, and we want to be uh, successful uh, in trying to give you all the tools that you need to build the best possible apps. And sometimes like when we do like three main releases a year and service packs in between, it gets to be repetitive. So we try to draw 
um, inspiration. Uh, and uh, I thought I would bring this out. So uh, this gentleman is Masaki Imai. Uh, about 30 years back, he wrote a book uh, called Kaizen, uh, which still is considered one of the um, cornerstones of like Japanese uh, uh, competitiveness. And Kaizen essentially means uh, improvement, continuous improvement. So there is a process, there is innovation, you measure how you're doing, you standardize things, and you repeat and rinse. Uh, so that's kind of our motto as well. With, uh, with DevCraft, we want to continually uh, give you more and more tools out of the box so you get to be more successful. So again, it's a brand new decade, so we thought like over mm -hmm. the holidays, we all took some time off and uh, thought about what are things we do and how can we plan things forward to enable developers to do better. Yep. So again, we're excited, as you can tell. So with that, let's talk about R1 2020. It was a big release. Uh, it actually went out last week, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, so the one point of uh, checking out everything that's new, uh, we're gonna try to uh, cover all of uh, what we can, but blogs.tillery.com, where every product uh, puts out uh, a blog that details exactly what we did uh, with that product. So. Uh, if you're using uh, a specific thing and that's all you care about, please uh, go and check out. But we also do encourage you to go and check out everything else that we did across all of the products. So blogs.tillery.com. Now, the bits are out. So uh, yes, everything are. that we are going to show you today, uh, some of the demos, uh, you need the latest bits to be able to uh, see them light up your apps. So go get the bits however you do. Uh, if you are just using NuGet packages, go get the updates. Uh, we know some of you use the uh, the control panel to kind of keep all of your Telerik uh, and Candida tools in one place. You'll see the updates uh, show up there. Uh, or if you just want to go up to the website and just download the DLL. So however you get it, uh, mm -hmm. get the bits because that's going to see uh, that's going to light up all the things that uh, we show you today. We genuinely care. Again, we are developers. Uh, we built uh, tools for developers, and we know developers will. Uh, struggle if we don't have the core pieces uh, in place, and that's docs and demos. And then we also have a feedback channel, which is very uh, uh, transparent. So you tell us the things that you are struggling with. You tell us the things, that, the next things that you want us to build. And our product teams sit down and we look at every feedback, trying to prioritize and come up with the roadmap of uh, all of our products. So uh, please, again, bookmark these things if you uh, are. Um, into using our things. And again, a lot of the demos that we show you today, especially the web stuff, it's all online. So you yeah. don't need to install anything. You can just check them out and uh, see what we did uh, for our 2020. So with that, um, let's talk about web, because this is exciting. A lot of exciting things happening with web forms, MVC core, not to mention this <laughs> other thing that Ed is into. So Ed, why don't uh, I, I have you take over and talk us through all things web. Yes, we have a crazy amount of things to cover. Our engineers have been really hard at work on putting together an extensive release for this year. Uh, and we are coming into 2020 just absolutely swinging for the fences. So let's talk about all of the things that we can build for the web. And again, I just want to have a little reminder, if you need to take a break and come back later, we are going to have these videos up on YouTube. Uh, they should be in two segments. Uh, so you'll find all the web stuff um, in this segment here. Uh, before I get started on .NET specific stuff, I just want to remind everyone, everyone that's a DevCraft subscriber uh, that we cover all of the spectrum of JavaScript development. And uh, some of you .NET developers are using Web API on the back end, JavaScript on the front end, and you have your choice of frameworks up front. And uh, what's really nice is, and you'll, you'll see this align with the next slide I've got as well, is with Kendo UI, um, you know, we're continuing to add things to our jQuery library. Mm. Uh, so, uh, like Sam said earlier, don't let somebody tell you that your platform is legacy or it's dead. Uh, we're still continuing to develop new components for the jQuery library. Absolutely. You'll see lots of nice things there. But we also are up to date on all of the Angular, React, and Vue component libraries as well. Uh, and we will go in-depth in all of those JavaScript libraries in our Kendo UI webinar. And that will be this Thursday at the same time. So make sure you tune in uh, and check out TJ and Alyssa for that. And <clears throat> I'd like to talk now about all the .NET stuff, because this is where my expertise is at. And again, the same type of situation uh, as we see with the uh, JavaScript side of things, uh, we have additions and updates in our web forms library. Uh, it's uh, compatible with .NET Framework 4.8. Uh, so we're going to continue to support that product. And um, it's something that we've been doing since 2000, or web forms is something we've been doing since 2002. Yeah, if, 17 uh, years. Wow. 
So that, that is a very stable uh, platform that people are still using, having a great deal of success with. A um, little more modern, MVC. So we, we have a complete set of tools for MVC. And uh, looking back at that, we've been working with this since 2009, believe mm-hmm. it or not. Um, so we've got a whole suite of MV, MVC tools. And we've also got um, support for .NET Core, which is uh, you know some of the newer stuff that's out. So that includes MVC Core and Razor Pages. And uh, that's that's uh, not so much of a history. 2017, so uh, it's still fairly modern stuff. And then there's the bleeding edge. So we're going to get into some Blazor. Uh, we've got support for ASP.NET Core 3.1, mm-hmm. uh, the latest Blazor bits, and uh, we've been uh, shipping since last year our our Blazor UI component libraries. Um, and we, we have some more slides in here to show you just how the server and client components of those line up and when the release dates are for those. But if you look at these four blocks here, you can see we've covered the complete spectrum of, uh, of stable, uh, tried and true .NET web forms all the way through the cutting edge, uh, bleeding edge of Blazor. Yeah. So it's a really exciting portfolio of tools to be able to work with, especially when you combine that with JavaScript. Uh, so we're going to have a quick poll to see what is your choice going to be for 2020? Which one of these uh, amazing frameworks are you going to be working with um, on the .NET side of things? Are you working with .NET Core, MVC? Are you still developing AJAX um, uh, applications, maintaining those things? Um, are you going to be transitioning to Blazor this year? What, it, what are you guys doing? Yep. Uh, so we'd like to hear that. And I mean, wh- while, we, while you're doing that, um, Ed lives and breathes <laughs> Blazor. He, he is the man to uh, talk about Blazor. And, and we are excited, obviously. Uh, so while uh, we are waiting, a uh, quick question. Um, do we have support for Visual Studio Code uh, to, do you use, to use our Blazor components? So support for Visual Studio Code uh, is still in its early phase um, with Microsoft, and I think we're waiting to see exactly how that shakes out. But we do have some ideas that we're working with uh, to support that platform. It's it's definitely something that's um, been a uh, something we're discussing, right, right. Uh, trying to figure out the right right tools for the job, uh, and that's something that that you all, you can all help with. Uh, go to feedback.teller.com. Let us know exactly what type of tools that you'd like to see for Visual Studio Code. Yeah, and I mean these are still early days, like the whole uh, server side, client side thing with WebAssembly. Mm-hmm. I think everyone's uh, just trying to figure it all out in 2020. So hopefully we'll see some traction and um, things uh, just light up this year. Yeah, and that's where user feedback really helps. Uh, and we're going to talk about ASP.NET AJAX first. We're going to talk about our, our oldest product, and then we'll work our way up to the bleeding edge. Uh, so the first thing that I want to mention is that we have a brand new multi-select component uh, for the ASP.NET AJAX platform. Uh, so this is a nice way to do a multi-select, where you can get a list of items and just pick through that list and select as many of those items from the list as you want. You've got a nice little uh, button there to cancel items that you don't. This is great for like if you have a, a, a form on your site where you're adding tags to something. Uh, so it's a, a nice common scenario for that. Um, and then we're also keeping that platform fresh by supporting the latest and greatest browsers. So uh, we have new support for the Microsoft mm-hmm. Edge Chromium yeah. edition. On my Mac, I actually switched to using Chrome quite a bit. Uh, same engine, so I mean, part of us like feels like uh, we are losing a rendering engine, but it's a new age of compatibility and moving Chromium forward, so we're excited. So if you don't know Sam, he's an interesting guy, he uses a Mac, uses Visual Studio Code for Mac, uses Edge and Bing, though. Yes. So. <laughs> I'd like to talk about uh, a, a Bing thing that you're supporting later on in this, uh, uh, when you talk about desktop. Very cool. Yeah. All right, uh, so I'm going to move on to ASP.NET Core and MVC. I like to talk to, talk about these together. One of the real differentiators between the two is just tag helpers. So essentially, you get the same components for MVC as you do Core, uh, but you have another way of writing the syntax with Core that you don't have in MVC. That's the only real difference you'll find there. Um, with MVC and Core, we have a couple new components that help you build forms and uh, make your make your apps look really nice. And one of those things is the badge. Uh, so this is a really flexible UI component that you can use to light up and highlight uh, sections of, uh, of the UI in your app. Uh, you can create little notification uh, icons and things like that. Um, it's very... Uh, 
a very handy utility to have uh, for your applications. We also have the bread com uh, breadcrumb component, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment. We'll do a quick demo uh, with some of these things. Uh, the checkbox and radio button um, have also been updated in this release, so they have nice animations. Uh, they look really clean, and uh, it's a nice addition to the portfolio. Um, we also have this really uh, complex control called the file manager that we just added. So you can add an entire file management type experience to your application very easily. Um, and this is one that I wanna break out and show a quick demo for. And I kinda chose to do this uh, alongside the other uh, components that I just mentioned, like um, the, uh, the breadcrumb control, because, and if we go to demos.telerik.com, you'll see so demos.telerik.com is where you'll find all of our web-based demos, um, and you'll find demos for our other uh, frameworks as well. I'm going to drill in over uh, to ASP.NET MVC, and we'll launch those demos. And then I want to take a look at the brand new file manager. Uh, what I find really interesting about the file manager is it's a component that is built from other components in the library. So I thought this was really interesting uh, that we, we can identify other components within uh, this really nice UI that we have. So this, this is an example of what can be accomplished with all of the little uh, Lego bricks that we mm -hmm. give you, uh, but we also are giving you these really robust controls that contain many things uh, in one. So in, within this, I can, di I can drill into folders. Uh, and this is all, anything you see here is completely customizable, has rich APIs wrapped around it. Uh, so I have a nice tree view on the, on the left-hand panel here. Uh, the tree view is a component that we offer as well as a standalone component. Uh, so are these sliders. Um, so these are our panels that you can, you can also use as a separate component. So it's and, almost like a desktop experience for the yeah. web. Exactly. So this is just like your desktop file browser. Uh, you can add this to your own ex um, app experience. Um, you'll also see that our um, we're we're using our own uh, breadcrumb control within the uh, the file browser. So um, this is a really interesting example because we're using components to build you a very robust component. Yeah. So you can you can get ideas from here. You can mm -hmm. uh, you can also implement this this nice uh, file management experience in your own app. Yeah, I mean internally like we dog food our thing our stuff all throughout the year, but it's good that we're actually putting some of our pieces together to make a more complex control. So if you want to talk about dog fooding, Sam, if we zoom in a little bit here, um, we're using our breadcrumb control, our brand new breadcrumb <laughs> control yes. here. Uh, we're also using it in the UI of the demo site itself. So you'll see that we're, we're taking full advantage of these components that we're building. Uh, we can navigate our demos this way, and we also have the ability to add that component within our file manager and, uh, and use it that way as well. Uh, file manager uh, has um, some very nice uh, built-in features. Um, uh, it has templating image previews that come up in a pop-up box. And again, all the APIs are there. And we never forget about accessibility. You'll see we've, we've got keyboard navigation out of the box as well. Uh, we want to make sure that everything that we have here is accessible and easy to use for all people. So a uh, quick pause uh, while you're switching gears to the next thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing a few questions. Uh, so every time we uh, do a release, it's, it's great to get a mix of folks. Uh, some folks have been using our stuff for years, while you might be also new to the Telerik Candidia family. So I'm seeing questions whether we uh, uh, support WPF and Xamarin. So all of that is coming up. So this is all the web stuff. I'm going to go over all of our mobile and desktop tooling. And then one quick question for you is uh, the file manager, does that uh, work nicely in stuff of boots in, inside of a bootstrap model or a mo modal uh, view, I suppose? Inside of a bootstrap modal view, um, I would assume it would work fine. I haven't tried it myself, uh, so I... I can't say yeah. from experience, but most of our components easily um, are are easily added to a modal dialog. Um, I can point out that we do have multiple themes for the components. So if I choose Bootstrap, it will uh, align with your visual uh, mm -hmm. part of the application. 
As far as putting in a mo mo eh, modal, we'll have to see. Um, might be uh, something our engineers can answer. They're, they're in the chat room now uh, answering questions for everyone. Uh, so maybe they can handle that. If not, you can always uh, ask us um, on uh, our Twitter yeah. um, or uh, submit a uh, support or feedback uh, question. Uh, it's a very interesting control though. Again, we're, we're dog fooding there. Almost everything you see in it comes from the component library itself. Um, and then we have uh, some other new uh, feature additions here. Uh, horizontal virtual scrolling hmm. is a new addition for the uh, ASP.NET MVC and Core Grid. Um, and this allows you to lazy load in many columns uh, from a data set. So this is really super um, useful for the finance industry. You know, you have a uh, massive amount of data that you need to pull in. Uh, you don't want that thing to be uh, slow and laggy, so you can uh, nicely transition those, those columns in. in a, um, it's only displaying what that user is, is seeing at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we give, you a, um, we give you an object on your server side. So if we go over to the demo, uh, you can see um, you can see the code for this up on the, the website, and I'm going to go over to the data grid, and you'll s notice, uh, let me back up for a moment, if you're on demos.telerik.com, you'll see all these little green badges that are up next to uh, certain components. Uh, these are a nice way to go in and see what updates we've made in the last release. So you'll see that the data grid has been updated, and we have the, um, the horizontal uh, column virtualization here. And the code is actually available on this page as well. And if I scroll, I'm using my, my trackpad here to scroll. You can wow. see just how performant that grid That's is. And behind the scenes, what it's doing is, uh, if we look at the controller for this, uh, we're getting back from the component a data source request object. And this object contains all of the things that the grid is asking for. Is it sorting? What page is it on? Um, it, what filtering uh, is in place? And what columns are within my view? And then what I can do with that data source request uh, is I can go into my entity framework query and I can apply that query against my, my, um, my database mm -hmm. by calling to data source result. And we can uh, build an expression tree based on what data you want to see, yeah. and then dynamically grab that from the database. I mean, we do UI virtualization for like um, vertical scrolling for our grids all over the place, like we're for mobile or desktop, but this is also nice to see horizontal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and those things come from you know customer requests. Yes. Th that's stuff that uh, we've had uh, several people from the finance industry, industry say, look, this is something that we really need yeah. and want. Uh, and we're able to make that happen. Uh, another thing that people really needed and wanted, we made happen, uh, DPL, or Document Processing Libraries for ASP.NET Core are available. Uh, they were available actually last release, mm -hmm. uh, but we've updated those and added some new things. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the DPL or Document Processing Library, these let you import, generate, uh, do office document conversion. Which is very important for enterprise apps. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, we, we tend to gloss over how much enterprise apps need uh, processing behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So one of the requests I would always get working as a contractor was you use the Telerik grid and you display the thing on the screen and immediately they want reports and mm -hmm. exports yep. and PDFs generation and all kinds of stuff. And this is what you can do uh, to make those folks happy is yeah. uh, use the DPL and generate those documents so for them. So I think them. the good thing is like you don't have to uh, use any third party. So you don't have to have uh, Office uh, subscriptions to do uh, some of these things. Mm -hmm. And it is for Word, Excel, uh, PDFs. And you're going to see, I mean, so these are .NET standard libraries. So we were able to separate out the functionality. So you're going to see me talk about the same things for Xamarin and for WPF. So uh, what we do for document processing is all throughout Telerik. I don't want to give away any yeah. big endings here, but uh, you can imagine if this is for .NET Core, then it probably runs anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so we might have a little announcement later as well. Uh, with that said, let's talk about Blazor. Um, I know so you're dying to. <laughs> we're going to talk about 
my favorite platform next. Uh, this is the newest thing from Microsoft is called Blazor. Um, it's an exciting new framework and uh, again we're gonna have a quick poll to see uh, if you guys are excited about Blazor just as much as I am. Uh, so this is something that I've uh, found at uh, our uh, Microsoft MVP Summit, uh, something that uh, Sam and I get to do once a year. It's a really exciting time. We get to go out to Microsoft, see what they're building, and uh, what, what the latest and greatest thing is. And uh, two years ago, I went out and I saw this thing called Blazor, and I thought it was fascinating. It changed your life. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> while we have the poll up, one quick other question here from Douglas here. Uh, do we have ASP.NET Core support for tag helpers across everything? I think we did that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when tag helpers came out, we slowly adopted those in. I think we did about half the library in R1 of 2017, I want to say. Uh, and then the second half uh, of 2017, we re released the, la the last half of them. And now when we add new components, we make sure that the tag helpers are there out of the box. So excellent question. We do have tag helpers for ASP.NET Core. Uh, and those are compatible with Razor Pages as well. So we've got you covered not only for MVC, uh, but for Razor Pages uh, for those type of things. Yeah. It'll be uh, good to see that um, almost 50% uh, of folks are looking into Blazor, which is exciting because, again, mm -hmm. early days. But if and when you are ready, uh, it'll be good to uh, see all of your Telerik UI just light up because we were the first to have uh, Blazor components, and we have been working nonstop, uh, our teams, with Microsoft to make sure our uh, Blazor components work both client-side and server-side. Yeah, what I like to see here is, you know, there's still a lot of people researching it, which is, is absolutely fair. I mean, it's brand new. Um, we have. I'll talk about what's released and supported in just a minute. Uh, but what's nice to, to know is uh, that uh, people are interested in it. And we did um, a community event last week that you can still go online and watch. So if you are still researching it, so in the 50% roughly that answered that. Uh, if you want to do some really in-depth research, go to AKAMS dot, or AKAMS slash focus on Blazor, and you will see a full day virtual conference, mm -hmm. uh, which I had the, the uh, pleasure yeah. of joining in. It was great, it was 24 hours nonstop, community driven, and I think the next uh, .NET conf is gonna be on Xamarin, so we're excited. Ooh, that should be yeah. fun. Uh, speaking of Xamarin, there was even an announcement during this about building Blazor yes. framework <laughs> applications that run on Xamarin. Uh, we won't be able to get into that today and unpack that. That's just crazy and yep. super bleeding edge, uh, but you can see the announcement there um, on the virtual conference. So let's talk about what exactly Blazor is uh, for, the, for the folks that haven't got uh, time to research it yet. Um, Blazor is a full stack C Sharp framework that can run server side or client side. So the way it runs client side is the uh, .NET runtime has been compiled to a web standard format called WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. So that's running in your browser and upon that framework we're able to load our .NET applications, our normal .NET code. Mm -hmm. So any type of uh, .NET standard DLL most likely can run in that uh, scenario. The the only caveat is you know if your your .NET library has some hard dependency on uh, like a, a desktop UI, it's not going to obviously run there. Any kind of business logic though um, that you've written prior to Blazor even uh, has potential to run there. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, turn of events because we don't have to use JavaScript. We can still use JavaScript with Blazor, but uh, we don't have to uh, rely solely on JavaScript to build uh, client-side applications anymore. Now, there's another interesting component to this framework is that it's agnostic of where it's running. So it can run completely client-side in the browser, or it can run completely on the server, um, and it does that through a signal R connection uh, versus running in WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. So we're able to run our .NET app on the server, and it will send pages and fragments of the updates that it requires to update the UI through a SignalR connection. So it's really cool bleeding edge stuff. Um, and when I say bleeding edge, uh, .NET Core 3.0 is the first time that Blazor was released and supported, and that is for the server side only. Now, later in May of this year, uh, we're going to see a preview, um, uh, or we're going to see the .NET framework 
uh, evolve into .NET 5, but Blazor client side will actually be released prior mm -hmm. to .NET 5. So uh, quickly, Neeraj on the um, uh, webinar is asking if uh, Blazor WebAssembly is in preview for ASP.NET Core 3.1. I want to say the server side is out of preview. You can use that. Server side today. is completely out of preview. Um, you'll see at the bottom of this slide here, we got two bullet points that talk exactly mm -hmm. about that question. Uh, so the question was, what, um, what version of Blazor is supported? And Blazor server side is supported um, in .NET um, ASP.NET Core 3.0 uh, in um, 3.1 LTS is production ready. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're able to use Blazor on the server side today and build applications uh, and start getting um, used to that framework. And I'll show a demo later uh, that, that kind of gives you the idea of what type of code we can write and how portable it is between server and WebAssembly, because there's very few changes to convert a server-side app to a client-side app. And, and we knew going into this that this would come up, so I think the UI, our UI is written in a way so that you can use it both ways. Yeah, our um, laser components are agnostic to where they run, so you can use our data grid with, uh, without changes on the server or WebAssembly side of things. What does change is how you fetch your data. So mm -hmm. You're in a connected environment on the server, so you get your data directly from the server itself, which means you're not in a RESTful uh, web, a you know, web API scenario. When you're on WebAssembly, the tables turn, and you got to fetch your data remotely. So those are the places you'll see your code changes, and we'll, we'll do a little quick demo later, uh, get an idea of how those things look. Um, so again, it's a full stack development framework. Um, and another thing that uh, is really interesting about it is it's part of the .NET Core ecosystem. Uh, so there are ways to get uh, your Blazor components running inside of ASP.NET Core MVC and Razor Pages applications. Um, that's still kind of on the bleeding edge side of things. Uh, so you're going you're gonna to have some learning curve there, uh, but it is something that's possible. So it's really cool stuff. Uh, again, the schedule uh, for .NET this year uh, on the Blazor side is um, it, it was released at .NET Conf in September. Uh, Long-term support for 3.1 uh, is here. Um, .NET 5.0 is looking to be uh, showing up in November of 2020. Uh, so we're going to see Blazor for WebAssembly land early this year in May. Uh, so that is exciting news. And we already have support for quite a few components for Blazor. And you'll, uh, you'll see in a little bit that we can build some pretty amazing apps already with all the things that we offer. And just in this release alone, we have many new, con new components. Uh, we have the scheduler is, is now uh, out uh, with all of its um, uh, abilities to edit uh, schedule items, um, drag and drop, all sorts of really cool stuff there. We have a brand new combo box uh, that extends um, you know, your basic dropdown into accepting uh, new and arbitrary uh, items, uh, an autocomplete component for doing like search capabilities and things like that. Um, and then our data grid has a bunch of new features as well. Uh, we have virtual scrolling uh, vertically, um, so for rows. Uh, and uh, column resize and reorder is there and batch editing. You can edit the grid in line. Uh, really nice experience there. Uh, we've also got uh, globalization baked into these components. So we'll, we'll take a look at that as well. And of course, accessibility is always at the top of our list. Um, OK, ironically, it's at the bottom <laughs> of the list. Uh, but it's important. Figuratively speaking, it's yeah. always important to us. Um, so uh, that's that's something that, that we're, we're always uh, trying to, to make sure that you can navigate these components with the keyboard. Uh, so we're adding that to all of our Blazor uh, components as well. Um, so I, we talked about the document processing library. And um, I said it can virtually run anywhere. So what exactly does that mean? Well, I'm going to go through a quick demo and show you uh, exactly how portable this is, uh, because now we have the DPL for Blazor. So I've got a demo here. I'm going to start with a blank page. 
and this is a Blazor application. All I've got right, right now is the JavaScript runtime. We're gonna need a little bit of JavaScript uh, to make this work because we need to access a file. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that in Blazor right now is with a little bit of JavaScript that's already been written uh, for this app. Um, you can find the same demo at demos.telerik.com. Um, I'll show you how to install that as well. So the first thing I wanna do is um, I wanna set up a method here uh, that is kind of like a catch-all or, or a home for all of my um, methods I need to run. So I'm gonna insert a code block here and I've got uh, kind of like a stub out idea of how I wanna load this data. And I'm gonna attach to a download handler. And what this download handler is gonna do is I wanna have a, have a button that I click on and it's gonna go through a couple steps in a process. The first thing I wanna do is I want to create a document. And I'm going to create a method called read document that's going to pull a doc file off disk. So this is running server side. I'm going to pull a, a document file off disk. And I'm going to put that in a system.io file stream. So I'm going to stream a file off disk and I'm going to create uh, with my document processing library a new uh, docs format provider, and then I'm gonna read the bits from this sample uh, doc file. So it's a DOSCX file. We're gonna import that with our file provider. So a real simple API to follow here. Next thing is once I read that document in, I wanna convert that to a PDF. So my next function that I'm gonna create is going to do exactly that. I'm gonna call it convert docs to PDF, and I'm gonna pass that document in. So let's take a look at what that code will look like. So I'm just kinda of copy and pasting this stuff in, because you guys don't wanna see me type code live, it's not fun. If you do wanna see that, you can join me on Friday on Twitch. Uh, we're gonna do a convert docs to PDF. I'm gonna pass in the rad, um, rad flow document here, which is our docs file, and we're gonna get back some bytes. So we're gonna send that down to the browser. So we need to send that down as bytes. I'm gonna use my uh, PDF format provider here, and I'm gonna read again that memory stream that I got from the, the docs file. And I'm gonna call export, and I'm gonna pass it in. And what I'm gonna get back is a PDF. So this is the DP DPL taking a, a docs file, converting that into a PDF on the fly, and then I'm gonna get the bytes from it and send that down to the browser. So that's the next step in the process. We need to save it. So I'm gonna save this converted file. I'm gonna pass in uh, my JavaScript runtime because to save a file in uh, the browser, we need to call on JavaScript and tell it to, to invoke that save behavior on the browser. I'm gonna pass in the brand new file we created as a PDF and give it a name of export PDF. So let's do that. Uh, our method called save is here. We're simply invoking a JavaScript function. So we're calling from C-sharp out to JavaScript uh, to tell JavaScript to save a file. And then finally, we'll just put a button on the page. And when I click this button, it's gonna set off that chain of events. So I'll control F5 here. And we'll run this uh, in the browser. And again, this is running server side. Mm -hmm. So it's reading a file off disk on the server and it's sending me the converted bits down to the browser. So now I have my download button. If I click download, I'm reading a docs file, nice. exporting a PDF. I've saved it to disk. I can open that up. I have a nice converted PDF file. Yep. That's pretty amazing stuff. And then while you were uh, cooking up that demo, Bill Wolf was just asking like if uh, DPL for Blazor, I mean, this is what it is, right? This and is DPL for Blazor. Yeah, and, and yes, you can work it with grids and charts and do all types of exports and imports. That was all happening server side. Yep. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, what if I did that on the client side? All right. So let's take a look at another project uh, that I've got here in my solution. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. You notice the project name is server. That's just hosting the static pages. So this is not actually running server side. It's just invoking IIS to, to send me the pages. You could put this on a um, GitHub pages and it would still work. Uh, you could put it in a static file host and it would still run. Um, in this project, I'm gonna go into my client under pages and I'm gonna look at my index page here where I've already typed all the code out. It's gonna be the exact same code, um, except I have 
uh, a little bit of a different scenario with how I'm going to get the data. So the page is on the, um, the server, on the server side scenario. On the client side, I don't have a place to read from disk. So instead, I have a file upload mm -hmm. uh, component. And I'm going to allow the user to choose a file. And I'm going to stream that in instead of reading from disk. That's the only difference, and it runs exactly the same. Uh, so, so while you're clicking that up, it's funny. Uh, Jagannath was asking if there was a file upload for Blazor, and that's exactly what um, he is. There is a file yeah. upload in that demo. However, it's not a baked-in component yet. Okay. So it's not part of the Telerik UI library. It is, however, in the demos. If you go install the demos, you'll find it in there. Um, it's just not something that we've put into the support channel and stuff yet. Yep. Uh, so you will find it in there, and you're able to use it. Um, it's something we want to build a more robust uh, sure. yeah. component around. Called. And uh, one quick thing uh, before we move on. Uh, Shauna was asking if the reverse works. Like, Could you do PDF to Word in Excel? Um, I would have to check on I think I, PDF I think is. Um, that's something hopefully our, our engineers can answer and support. I don't want to give false information. Okay. Um, I, reading a PDF is a little more complex than mm -hmm. reading a, a docs file, so I'm not 100% sure if that is a possibility or not. Uh, so last but not least, I want to show um, our brand new Blazor PDF, uh, PWA demo. Nice. So this is a progressive web application that is running on Blazor in the client side, and it uses a variety of our components from our, our toolkit. And uh, it's a really nice looking app. It's mobile responsive, so you can um, pull it up on your phone. You can actually save it to your phone like an icon and load mm -hmm. it because it's a PWA. And then while you were talking about the, all of the web stuff, like I deal a lot with mobile, and with the like, Kendo UI and, and Blazor, we are giving you multiple ways to use our UI for web apps that also mm -hmm. work nicely on, on mobile. Exactly. I mean, we have lots of different ways to, to tackle these things now. Uh, as developers in, um, with Blazor, since it has a client-side uh, mechanism for it, we can, um, we can load that app in an offline state um, and allow uh, PDA, PWAs to happen. And what's really cool about this, if you see this application opened up, um, I have this section here at the bottom that says, would I like to install this application? Mm -hmm. So with the click of a button, I can take my web application and make it look and behave like a desktop app. Uh, we'll do that in just a sec. Um, let's take a quick look here at what we have. Uh, we've got our chart here that has different ways to drill into um, the reporting time frame. Uh, we can also choose dates. And we also have different uh, charts that are available. Uh, we also have our data grid here that we can select different items from. We can add and remove. So it's a pretty fully featured um, demo that we've created. Uh, we can even click through and see kind of like a, a drill down um, into a user profile. These things look really nice. Um, you can make uh, gorgeous looking applications uh, that have, uh, again, that desktop uh, type functionality. Uh, so let's uh, take a click on this install. And you'll notice I get a pop-up message mm -hmm. that says, would you like to install this app? If I hit install, notice the browser goes away. Yeah. And now I have my application running desktop style. I even mm -hmm. get um, at the bottom here, um, I get the uh, icon at the bottom. Um, and if I'm hovering over it, I even get my preview. Nice. So it, it acts very much like a full desktop application. Yeah. So that is going to wrap it up for my time. Hopefully, um, you guys found all these new things exciting. We have uh, those demos that I showed you. You can get those off the Telerik uh, control panel. Mm -hmm. So if you zoom in, or I've got it zoomed in here, just click Local Demos, and it will install those on disk for you. That's where you'll find the upload component example in there as well. Again, that wasn't a baked in thing, but it's, uh, it's in the demos for you to grab and um, learn how to do that. Um, and then also we have Telerik Test Studio. If you're looking at how to test uh, all these applications, PWAs, uh, um, it works for all sorts of platforms, uh, web, mobile, et cetera. Uh, check out Telerik Test Studio. Grab a 30-day free trial of that. It's a, a really, really nice tool for uh, doing your um, your UI testing. 
Yeah, so lots and lots of excitement across everything web. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, we, we tried answering as many questions as we could live on air. And again, we are answering questions on the Q&A panel. Uh, again, if it, if it doesn't get answered right away, I mean, we will uh, follow the breadcrumb and make sure you have an answer uh, right after the webinar. And again, please feel free to ask these same questions on, on Twitter with the uh, hashtag HeyTillEric and also ping us, uh, either of us, online. Um, anything else on the web front? Uh, no, just make sure you go to uh, your control panel or online and get the fresh bits. Again, when you're installing these things, make sure you check that local mm -hmm. demos box, especially yeah. on the Blazor stuff, so you can find those brand new demos that we have. And uh, actually, a backup here as well, if you're looking for the PWA uh, demo, we've got a, a link here on our GitHub. Um, One behind? So, yeah, so you can find our PWA app on GitHub. It's at Telerik slash Blazor Stocks, Blazor, nice. Blazor Dash Stocks. Uh, so you can find that, download it, and give it a try. And, and this has imp interesting implications for mobile as well. Uh, the same mm -hmm. idea could be taken on a mobile form factor. You take away the uh, Chrome, um, and you could have a service worker running. Same app, just runs everywhere. Yep, this is, I actually have this on my phone. Showed it to okay. Sam earlier. It yep. looks really nice on the phone and uh, pretty performant on the phone as well. So okay. All right, so that's it with the web portion. Again, uh, please reach out to Ed for all things web. Uh, we're going to take uh, a quick one-minute pause here, and then for all of you asking about all things desktop and mobile, that's coming up right after the break. All right, uh, welcome back. We didn't really go anywhere. We're just standing here. Uh, <laughs> but that was all the web stuff. Now let's get into all of the other things we do. And uh, I have 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to try going a little fast uh, so I can cover everything. Again, please feel free to keep the questions coming uh, so we can answer some of them on air and also uh, type up the answers as we go along. OK, once again, this is the R1 uh, Telerik release webinar. Uh, Ed talked about all things web. Now let me get into some of the other things. Uh, and let me start with mobile. Uh, hopefully, it's 2020. Mobile isn't an afterthought. Uh, we have to have a mobile strategy as to how we build for mobile. I mean, remember, it doesn't need to be always a mobile app, but we have to build for mobile because otherwise we miss a big person, a big percentage of our audience. So how do we go about doing that? Again, multiple ways in which you can do this. Uh, if you're into web technologies, clearly you can do PWAs, uh, mobile web. Uh, if you're building native apps, uh, again, that's expensive. Hopefully you're building a cross-platform solution. Again, with the JavaScript side of the family, we do make frameworks like NativeScript, which is open source. But again, we are all .NET developers, and that's what we would like to do to make truly cross-platform apps from a single code base. So uh, let me dive into that, and uh, that essentially means Xamarin, right? So with C Sharp, with .NET, with Visual Studio, I get to use the best-in-class tooling, and I'm making truly native cross-platform apps uh, for iOS, Android, all things Windows, uh, and other platforms like Tizen. So it's a really good, uh, good place to be. Uh, to reuse your, uh, your .NET skills. So really quickly, two ways in which you can uh, kind of build Xamarin apps fundamentally. One is Xamarin iOS or Xamarin Android, which is where you're sharing some C Sharp logic, but you're building the heads, the UI heads for each platform separately. And then the one that I'm more fond of is Xamarin Forms because it lets you have a shared UI abstraction layer as well. So I don't need to learn a lot of iOS or Android. I can just uh, write XAML, and then at runtime, it gets rendered as native UI for iOS, Android, and Windows. So uh, this is the place which is easiest to get started uh, in. But again, feel free to dive into Xamarin iOS or Xamarin Android if that's what you want to do. Uh, for us, uh, this is one uh, thing that I spend a lot of time with. It's Telerik UI for Xamarin. It's something I'm, I'm passionate about. And again, our goal is to make the lives of Xamarin developers easy. Uh, so we give you a lot of things out of the box. So all of the controls that I'm going to talk about today, uh, they're for Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, and Xamarin Form. So a lot of it are uh, native controls that we write for each platform. Some we use a little bit of Skia Sharp. Uh, but again, all of that is seamless and um, transparent to you as a developer. You can work on it from Windows or Mac. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, no matter what mobile platform you're on, uh, we have sample apps in store. So you can actually play around with the, our UI before you uh, consider using it inside of your apps. It's super easy to get started. Uh, and again, our goal is to give you the best possible uh, UI for Xamarin developers out of the box. So you're not having too many dependencies. Uh, we will give you nice templates to get started with, uh, lots of uh, help with like common screens, like login screens, credit card screen, uh, setting screens. So again, we are trying to do as much as we can to help make Xamarin developers uh, more productive. So with that, 
Let's dive into what's new uh, with Xamarin in the R1 2020 release. Uh, several very, very exciting controls. Uh, we're going to start with some pickers. And these are some things that have uh, shown up a lot in our feedback channels because uh, what you get out of the box, the drop down experience is just not ideal uh, for mobile. So ideally, you'd want something that scrolls easily. Ideally, you'd want something that is modal and it's easy for the user to just tap, tap, and go. Uh, so that's why we spent a lot of time this release in coming up with some really nice, shiny, performant pickers. So let's start with the list picker. This is uh, one where you get to the user gets to select a single item out of a list, and you have complete flexibility as to how you present uh, that list. Could be a modal pop-up, uh, could be anything else, however you want to style it. Uh, you can make it look like whatever you want. It's completely templatable. And um, again, you can have multiple string formats in how you want to display it. When it comes to scrolling, we made sure the virtualization thing that Ed showed about uh, showed off uh, with virtual uh, with horizontal scrolling, the vertical scrolling works just as fine uh, for grids and and for pickers as well. Uh, so again, this is full featured uh, picker controls. So that's just the list. Then date time. This is one of the most uh, common things that um, uh, people are picking from. Uh, all right, so let's uh, look into how we can have uh, a little bit of help when it comes to date and, and time selections, or a, a mix of both. Uh, and again, this could be presented in a modal <coughs> pop-up, or it could be uh, any how you want to style. You can have multiple tabs for picking the date or the time. Uh, again, full support for infinite scrolling uh, for dates as well. Now, this is the templated uh, picker control. And this one is... I will comment, too, on the... Uh um, on these pickers, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm always a fan of the web, mm -hmm. and, and I love PWAs, and that we can go anywhere. Yep. This really shows how the UX can shine yes. on yep. native mobile applications. Yep. That's why I think uh, companion apps are awesome, mm -hmm. and it's yep. really nice that .NET developers have another channel where they can pull in something like a companion app and make a really nice UX right, that these right. pickers provide. And, and mobile isn't easy. I mean, uh, native mobile takes a lot of uh, little nuances to get used to and present the UX in a way uh, that is comfortable for the user. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the list picker and the date time picker isn't uh, doing it for you, this is the templated picker. This is the, the most agile option. You can literally get a placeholder and you can put whatever you want in it. You can put Very a nice. calendar in it, a uh, scheduler in it, whatever you want, and then the cancel and OK buttons will do whatever you want as well. Uh, this one here is a demo that's showing, uh, and this is great for like showing some of the drill down options. So you pick one option based on that, some of the next options change. So it's great for things like that. So again, has all of the features that I talked about with the other pickers. This is just much, much more customizable. So uh, looking at the other side of the family uh, with some of the other controls, calendar is something that's incredibly hard to do for iOS, Android, and doing it natively, doing it nicely. Uh, we have had calendar controls forever, but we keep on improving on it. Again, the whole Kaizen um, uh, mindset. So new uh, in this release is a whole new agenda view. So again, this is very common for us to kind of see what's coming up in our day. Uh, all, of the, all of your meetings, your, all of your events, they can be presented in a chronological way nicely color-coded. Uh, we also have a way of showing you kind of the non-working and the working hours based on the calendar uh, and the start and the end times of your day. Uh, so again, we are really trying to make sure that um, you can give your users multiple ways to look at their calendar uh, with any type of, type of views that they might uh, care for. And I'll, I'll show you some of these things really quickly. Uh, so back to DPL. Again, we are, we are fond of this because you, you realize how much enterprise apps need this stuff. Uh, CSV processing, importing and exporting out of it, uh, all of the Word stuff, all of the uh, PDF stuff. We had all of that in the last release. But what's new, uh, what we did this year uh, for Xamarin's side of the story, it RAD spread processing, which is all of your Excel spreadsheet processing. You can create, uh, you can modify, you can um, uh, manipulate Excel spreadsheets. Uh, again, we can read uh, in a stream, do it all in memory, and the API is extensive. You have support for just about every format that you can think of, and within the uh, docs itself, you can manipulate shapes and hyperlinks and grouping and filtering, all sorts of things, formulas uh, that you use in Excel, find and replace, so truly Excel through an API. And you can uh, render these things uh, on, on Xamarin apps. You can export, you can import. So really, at this point, we have full coverage of all things document processing. What's really nice about the API is you can make a call to SQL, loop over that data, sure. and render rows for a, a Excel spreadsheet directly out, yep. uh, or convert them to a PDF even. Uh, so it's pretty extensive. 
Yeah, the, the conversion is nice. You can um, bring in Excel, convert that into PDF or DOCX or uh, other way mm -hmm. around as well. So we're excited uh, to provide all things uh, DPL. Uh, now, for Xamarin developers, again, our goal is to make you productive. So lots and lots of help. Uh, every one of our Xamarin controls, which is uh, a good like 50 or so, all of them work with hot reload. Again, this is your dev loop and trying to make that as tight as possible. Uh, so if you have uh, your simulator or your uh, device open, we will hot reload. Just the moment you uh, touch the XAML, we know exactly what you're changing. And some of it comes from Microsoft, and we have made sure every one of our controls works nicely with hot reload. We are looking ahead as well with hot restart. Uh, once that comes, allowed, uh, comes out, we'll make sure uh, things work as well. Again, we are continually making sure that you are productive as a Xamarin developer. Uh, lots of enhancements across uh, other things uh, within the Xamarin family, uh, data forms. Uh, list views, side drawers, image editors. Uh, again, these are some of the newer controls that we have done in the last couple of releases. We are just making sure things are more polished and they are uh, as performant and full featured as we, as we can make them. Okay, uh, so let's uh, jump into a quick demo with Xamarin, and then I'm going to switch over to the desktop side of the family. So uh, this is where I'm going to pull up Visual Studio for Mac. I live and breathe in this thing. It's uh, it really is about the same uh, for Visual Studio on Windows. Quick question while you're pulling that up, Sam. Uh, Somebody was asking if Xamarin is free now. So Xamarin, I, you know, the framework, uh, the, the component library is still a commercial thing, but Xamarin itself is free now? Yes, so Xamarin developers, this used to be a pain point, it was expensive. But ever since like 2016, I think when uh, Microsoft took over, Xamarin as a framework is completely free and open source. Uh, so yes, you can build it, you can do pull requests, uh, there is no barrier to entry. Uh, and again, we'll give you, I mean, what you get out of the box is just enough to get going. But again, if you're building a professional app, especially if you want to put it out in the stores, you're going to need some UI help, and, and that's where we come in. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, a quick solution here. Uh, if you uh, head out to Tillery.com, and if you, uh, do, uh, if you go into Xamarin, uh, let me go into the product page here. If you hit that big uh, download button, we are going to give you the source code that I'm going to show you, and we give you the binaries and some examples. So this is the same app that, uh, the same code base that actually powers our sample app that's in the store. So let me go ahead and run this, and uh, it's going to pull up the iOS uh, simulator since I'm on a Mac. Uh, it's called the QSF. I took out the UWP and the Android bits, but again, there is no platform-specific code here. It's literally all in a .NET standard library. So here's my iOS simulator coming up. As that loads, yeah. Sam, um, we're t we've been talking a lot about the DPL, and it's, I think quite a few people are excited about it. So we're having some common questions. Um, most of it is, is it supported on, on the platform I'm on? You know, we showed Web and Xamarin, and it's support on all of those things, uh, Ajax and MVC and Blazor and Xamarin, mm -hmm. uh, but it also works on desktop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so so uh, all of our document processing, all of the processing that we're doing, uh, that's just code, that's just API, and that's mm -hmm. a .NET standard library, it's just wrapped up. So any place that runs a .NET standard DLL, you'll be able to run so it. So WPF, sure. uh, absolutely. native desktop, yep. all those things. Yes. All right, so here's the uh, app that you can also play around with uh, on your phone. Uh, let me go into some of the newer controls. This is the uh, date time picker. Uh, let's just say you're trying to rent a car, and the first thing you want to do is uh, uh, choose a date and time. So again, smooth scrolling for the year, uh, the month, and again, the time as well. Again, notice how the little tabs are. You can customize all of these things and exactly how they look. So again, really smooth scrolling experience on, on mobile. Uh, so that's just the date and time picker together. You can obviously do just the date or just the time. Uh, now let's go into uh, the list picker here. Uh, this one here is uh, about like shoe sizes. And again, uh, this will bind to anything. This is just an observable collection that it's binding to. Uh, and then if I go into color, again, notice how you can really customize how the look and feel of things are once you're inside the list view. This is all driven by templates. And again, the template picker will let you just go uh, nuts with whatever you want to do. Uh, this one here is just still the list picker. It's, it's showing you some colors here. Uh, so it's, it's a really nice experience. Um, and then let's go on to uh, the template picker. This one will give you that drop-down experience that I was talking about. This one is searching for flights. When I go do a from, notice how as I switch the countries, uh, the cities obviously change. That's so, very nice. Yeah, so again, these are things that are really just hard to do on mobile. Mm -hmm. the, the UX uh, suffers no matter how you try to do it with like cascading drop-downs. Now you can do it all in one place. Yeah, yeah. cascading drop-downs 
aren't the most no. mobile friendly experience. No. That's yes. that's really nice. And again, the templated picker lets you put anything you want inside of it. Could be a calendar, could be anything else. So that really all works together with pickers. Uh, let me show you a little bit of spread screen processing. Uh, so this one uh, is just uh, uh, a whole bunch of rows and columns, uh, and you're, we are displaying uh, exactly the Excel spreadsheet here. You can um, generate this in different types of formats. And once you're done, essentially, we will generate uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And all of these things are defined in the uh, in, in, in your code through the API. So it's just an XLS file we're generating. You can share this, you can download this, uh, and, and do whatever else you need. Uh, this has other features, so I can convert. Uh, so I can uh, take an XLS um, uh, document and I can convert it to CSV or, or PDF, which is nice. Uh, and then I can generate that again. And I can also do find and replace. So if, I, if you're looking to replace words, uh, you can do that as well. So really full-featured Excel with find and replace, with uh, formulas uh, and uh, row and cell editing all within uh, within Xamarin. This is nice because you can build apps that deeply integrate into your infrastructure mm -hmm. and yep. interact with uh, stuff that you, you need to do on premises. Exactly. Uh, so again, word processing, we did that last release, but again, please do check it out. Uh, let me show you a little bit of code as to how we pull this off. So back to the list picker here, uh, we were matching on like sizes and colors. Let me show you how, how some of this code looks like. This is the code for uh, the list picker, and it's just a whole, got a whole bunch of styles here. It's just pure XAML, all written inside the .NET standard library. So there is nothing iOS or Android specific here. Uh, you will see that we have uh, uh, a rad list picker right here. The bindings are super simple. This is just binding to the sizes, and it's a two-way binding. So once you have an object collection, we can keep track of the UI updating the object as well as the object updating the UI. Here's my view model. It is super simple. Here are all of my colors. And we're going to bind to a collection of sizes and a collection of, these are the collection of sizes, these are the collection of colors. And that's what we are binding to. It's super simple. And if you look at uh, the uh, red list picker for, um, for the colors, this is where we get to define the templates. So here's the list picker, and you can see that we are uh, binding it. Uh, let's move down a little bit uh, to the, What's nice so here's about my, yep. What's nice about our APIs is they're pretty common across all components. You'll find the same templating mechanisms yeah, and right. binding syntax. And especially for XAML. If you're doing anything WPF, this will be exactly what you expect. So here's my rad list picker, binding it to the colors uh, observable collection. And inside of it, I get to define a display template. You can control how each item looks like. You can control the selected item. And it's all controlled within the template. I have a grid that shows a label. A box view is what's giving you the circle. So again, it's really customizable. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to the date picker. Again, no surprises here. Uh, this one is just going to bind to, uh, here's my rad date time picker, binding it to a start date and an end date. Again, I have those corresponding uh, properties in my view model, so I can bind and I can read what the user is uh, selecting. Uh, this is my uh, first look at uh, the uh, spread processing, which we saw. Again, no UI actually here. Uh, we are not generating anything in the XAML. All of it is done here in the code behind. If I look at uh, some of the code here, this is where we are generating a workbook. Right, so this is where we start uh, creating a workbook. When you hit the generate uh, button, it uh, triggers a command. And this is where we start creating a workbook. This is essentially an Excel workbook. And you have an extensive API. Uh, here's where we are reading a stream. We are doing it all in memory. And we could be uh, 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 reading something out of a file, or we could be writing to a file. And this is where we get to define the headers, like the cells. Notice the granularity of exactly how you can uh, make it, uh, how you can define the workbook. And then you can have formulas inside of it, all of that. Uh, and at the ed end of it, you just uh, take out the memory stream and um, you export a task. And that renders uh, the workbook on your Xamarin apps, or you could also um, export it out uh, through any format. <coughs> So again, real flexibility. We are trying to make sure Xamarin developers have uh, everything they can, um, they need to be more productive in terms of UI and also in terms of uh, more document processing for their everyday needs uh, for enterprise apps. Okay, let's uh, move on to other things here, and uh, I think we might have a quick poll. Uh, again, tell us uh, uh, how you feel about this next question that's coming up. Any questions we can answer in the meantime? Um, this one was uh, answered by one of our engineers, but I think it's very interesting. Uh, somebody was asking if we can run the DPL from an AWS Lambda uh, using .NET Core. 
Well, I mean, you uh, again. I, I don't want to give you a wrong answer here. We can um, uh, collaborate and get back. But I, I, I want to say, like, you have to have our bits, and then mm -hmm. as long as your application supports .NET standard and the application is wrapped up inside something that AWS Lambdas can host, then then yes. Yeah. Our engineers say that if it is a .NET Core runtime, then yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's a pretty interesting use, but uh, something you can do. Yeah. All right, so again, for Xamarin developers, uh, please uh, let us know what else you would like us to do. I think it's pretty full-featured, but we are keep on uh, iterating uh, so we can do the latest and greatest in terms of productivity, as well as UI components that you tell us uh, that you need for your apps, and uh, we'll uh, look to prioritize and go build them in the next release. All right, so uh, moving on uh, to desktop. Again, uh, some of you were asking, what happened to desktop? Why is there no love? There is a lot of love. And again, especially in terms of desktop, what we see from last year, September, is when we had the .NET Conf release uh, with mm -hmm. uh, .NET Core 3.0. Uh, this is exciting time because uh, we are bringing over all of your desktop applications, sort of modernizing them. Uh, so again, if you are building WPF and WinForms applications, you can mix and match uh, with what you did before with some of the newest APIs. You can do XAML islands. You can do inking support. You have a modern web browser, uh, and you can mix and match. So really, is, I mean, desktop is uh, almost as new as, uh, as it was when we first started. And desktop doesn't always need to be just for desktop. It could be for kiosks. It could be for other types of applications. So let's talk about some of the things we can do for desktop. So let's start with um, uh, WPF. And well, this is uh, one slide that kind of talks about all the things that I did just talk about. Everything in desktop is also open source. So WinForms, WPF, it's all open source. So again, you're coming into a really nice, collaborative, rich environment uh, with Windows 10 and the flexibility that you have with side-by-side -side, uh, XEs and uh, installing different versions of .NET on your platforms. Let's see what we can do. So we have uh, two uh, very, very rich uh, UI suites for WPF and WinForms. This is kind of where we started. It's been around for like 15 years, so 100 plus controls in either uh, WPF or WinForms controls. We are happy to announce that uh, as of now, like .NET Core 3.0 came out, and then we have had a few iterations. 3.1 is where Microsoft has a long time support LTS uh, licensing, and we have full compatibility. So. What you build today is going to stand for the next 10 years, uh, and, and our bits included. So uh, we are happy to announce that. Let's dive into WPF and look into uh, some of the things uh, we can do for desktop development on WPF. We have looked at some of the high priority feedback items that came in. And I think we did uh, some of the best ones that we could really uh, put in a lot of effort, but they're, they're really rich components that are just impossible to build by hand. So first up is a task uh, board, and I, I love this. So this is exactly like a Kanban board that you see on the web. Mm -hmm. except you can just do it on your desktop applications. Think about an enterprise app that you might be building uh, to track uh, any items throughout their life cycle. It is exactly a Kanban board, and you can move things. Uh, you can have different types of columns, uh, great API uh, set to kind of style it however you want, and also to programmatically move things around. So obviously, drag and drop support, but you can also do things programmatically with touch support. So again, if you have it on a kiosk with the WPF app, you can move things around. Uh, really, really nice. I, I, I want to uh, show this off as quickly as I can. Um, and let's talk about some of the other things here. Splash screen. So again, if your WPF app takes a few seconds to load up, you can throw in a nice uh, splash screen so we can keep the user engaged that something is going on. You can have a percentage loading uh, indicator, uh, again, progress indicators, uh, different types of animations or images. Uh, and you can style it however you want based on the themes uh, of uh, all of the Telerik UI, as well as any themes that Windows uh, might be able to do uh, for you. So again, really rich uh, control set uh, for starting up your applications. Uh, there is a calendar, obviously, when, inside of uh, WPF. Uh, and the agenda view that I talked about for Xamarin also makes its way uh, into WPF apps. Again, a nice chronological way of sorting things by date and uh, making things nice and color-coded so it's easy for the user to see exactly what's going on, uh, different types of date formats and uh, styling APIs so you can make this look exactly the way you want. Syntax editor. This is something we kind of started doing in the last release. Uh, it's, it's now official uh, out of the box. Uh, we had a beta tag, but it was functional last release. We really polished things up. This is great if you want to build a place where your users can type in some code. And it doesn't always need to be code. It could be any custom language. But if you want that experience of having like code highlighting, code completion, 
Uh, you can all do all of that. It does support uh, a huge gamut of programming languages, which you can also define your own. Uh, custom language definitions and highlighting options. And everything that you expect, like from a code editor, you have it out of the box, like undo, redo, find and replace, uh, zooming, different types of color palettes. Uh, it, it's all there. And it's very, very rich. And it's baked into uh, every WPF app that you can build with, uh, with our Telerik UI. Uh, with WPF, uh, a few more other things that we have done. We really want you to be successful, obviously. So we are helping you out not just with UI, but in uh, how you build your apps, how you get started. Any greenfield projects, we are giving lots and lots of templates out of the box uh, with .NET Core 3.0 support. So some of these templates actually have like our uh, NuGet bits built in. So you don't have to go and get it anymore. So you can start with like a calendar view or award-inspired uh, application or an Outlook-inspired application, and you have the Telerik UI right there. So you don't have to do anything. You can just drag and drop and get started. Uh, again, splash screens, uh, different types of windows, ribbons, different types of tab views in your app. There's a good starting place uh, for all of those things with our templates. And again, we will bring you all of the Telerik UI in your, uh, in your toolbox so you can uh, have easy access to them as you're lighting up the UI for your apps. Uh, a few more things. Um, the docking control is really popular. It helps you kind of dock your WPF apps. That gets a high DPI support. Uh, this is something Windows is iterating on, and we are keeping a uh, close eye on it. So it is monitor aware and also aware of the DPI of each monitor, so that, that is nice. If you are doing uh, file dialogues, when you right click, you can customize exactly how uh, what the menus look like, and you can hide and show things programmatically. Uh, if you are doing spreadsheet processing, uh, you can have per user uh, hide or uh, show of sheets. Uh, you can kind of hide a few workbooks uh, for some users and uh, not for others. So again, lots of love throughout, uh, throughout WPF. Any questions on WPF? Um, I don't see any right now. OK. Uh... So let's move on. Let's talk about WinForms. Again, this has been out there. But again, it, this kind of shows you a classic case of how desktop development should look like in 2020. It's modern. Mm -hmm. It's uh, You are using .NET Core. You're using all of the latest um, uh, APIs and, and UI control. So why not make modern desktop applications for Windows? Visually stunning Windows applications that really amaze the user on any Windows machine. Uh, and the Windows machine doesn't just need to be a laptop. It could be any different things. So the syntax editor that we just saw for WPF, it's uh, fully baked in for WinForms as well. Again, think about the type of apps you're building with WinForms. If there is any way for the user to, or any chance for the user to start typing a few things, you may want to throw this in so that they have nice syntax highlighting, they have nice code completion, uh, and all of the features, uh, find and replace, keyboard shortcuts, localization, all of those things are baked into WinForms as well. So this is something we are really excited about. It's nice if you have a power user tool that you know you want yeah. people to be able to write SQL queries or yeah. something like or that. Or build the next VS Code <laughs> in WinForms, why not? OK, the next, this next thing, this actually was highly uh, uh, requested. We have a virtual keyboard for WinForms. And uh, let me just clarify what this uh, really should be used for. It's for augmenting what you already have. So if you have a Windows laptop, you obviously have a physical keyboard. But if you are making a kiosk, then you may not always have a physical keyboard. This supports uh, touch. Okay. And if you want to build like AR, VR experiences, you need a virtual keyboard. Otherwise, the user has no way to enter stuff. So this one is for WinForms. It's fully baked in, uh, touchscreen interface. It has uh, like four or five different types of layouts for keyboards that, that are kind of standard. Uh, it will synchronize with the Windows uh, input locale. So if you change your language uh, or if you change your settings for where you are in the globe, it will readjust. So this is really nice. Again. Uh, an alternative input control for WinForms applications, which is uh, something we're excited about. It's nice to see globalization in all of our products. Yeah, yeah. And if you uh, if you need to put love and care in your apps, globalization, localization, that's one of the first things you do. Because you drive up engagement. People like to see things that are familiar to them. Absolutely. Right? OK, uh, a few other goodies. Uh, like Ed said, I'm probably the most prolific Bing user outside of Microsoft. <laughs> uh, but uh, Bing, I didn't actually know this uh, until a few days back when I looked this up. Bing has uh, a very nice mapping solution. Mm -hmm. And they have a thing for uh, mapping truck routes. So it turns out trucks uh, cannot always take the same roads that we take in our cars. Uh, there are truck attributes like weight and time of the day, bridges and tunnels. So there are lots of things to kind of uh, keep in mind when you're uh, kind of trying to define a route for your truck and your deliveries. Bing will give all of you uh, all of that to you out of the box, and we can map it for you with our mapping component. So I thought this was really cool, uh, kind it's of a, a unique. Yeah, it's a unique use case. Again, lots of people build apps for their 
on-field services on their enterprise apps. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is something that if you're into that industry and that vertical, uh, this is great for you to be able to map a, a truck route uh, anywhere in, uh, in the world. Bing Maps will give you the route and we can map it for you. Um, more enhancements with the file dialogs. Uh, anytime you have favorites, just like you have in your desktop file explorer, we can maintain the favorites. Um, so uh, we can give you a nice easy way to pick your files or whatever else you are choosing. Again, uh, with .NET Core 3.0, when WinForms first came out, uh, there, were, there were some rough edges. And these are things that Microsoft has fixed. And these are things that we have fixed. Uh, so with 3.1, we have LTS support and really full, fully featured. So every UI component works on .NET Core 3.0. And, and that took us some time to get to, but uh, we're, we're happy to be here. Quick question, Sam. Yeah. It's perfect timing. Um, virtual keyboard question. Uh, are there any other platforms that's supported on this, this user is asking specific, specifically about WPF? Um, I can quickly check. Uh, I want to say yes, or if not, again, please, uh, please tell us. So let's go quickly into WPF. And... It may have been the first time we did this. Uh, if so, uh, it's, it's going to come to other platforms. You know okay. that. So um, uh, it looks like we may not have it, but uh, you can go to feedback.telerik.com yeah. and uh, submit a request for that, and uh, we'll have to check that out. Yeah. All right, so this is where um, Ed likes to make fun of me because I'm on a Mac, and I'm a full uh, .NET <laughs> developer on a Mac, so I'm going to pull up my virtual uh, desktop. And that's Parallels. Eh, you can use multiple things here. So I like Parallels. .NET Core Inception. <laughs> it works. It just keeps your fan going quite a bit. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pull up uh, my Windows 10 machine here. And I, I believe that's probably going to be the same uh, uh, answer for UWP for the keyboard. Um, right. I think I think you're right. The uh, um, the one that you showed is the first iteration. Yeah. Uh, so it hasn't made its way into other other products yet, and I think demand would. Uh, dictate where that, that shows up next. Absolutely. So the best way to get that is the feedback portal. Yep. And I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit so I can do justice to some of the other things. But uh, let's talk about WPF and WinForms here really quick. Again, if you go out to the product homepages, you can download the trials. We give you the sample app and all of the code so you can see exactly how we are building these sample apps. And again, full-featured, visually stunning apps. That's what we're looking for. Uh, so this is the WPF app. Uh, the nice thing is you can actually play around with some of these things right here inside the app. So this is the progress control or the splash screen control that shows the progress indicators. Uh, so if I click on it, you can see different types of ways in which you can show progress. It will listen to whatever theme that you have. So if I uh, move to a dark theme, you will see the splash screen kind of change. Uh, and the loading thing, you can really customize it uh, to show whatever progress indicator you want to show. Um, and this could also be tied to directly the percentage loading of what you have. Uh, so if I go and look at the code here real quick, uh, here's my first look. Um, and the nice thing is we show you the code right here inside uh, the app. So if I go in here, uh, here's my uh, example. And if you notice here, what we are doing essentially is uh, we are trying to show a splash screen and uh, that is hooked up to a data context and uh, that essentially comes back to hearing the progress value so we can map exactly how much you're done and then we uh, we can close the splash screen but then this is the rad splash screen manager show so we'll programmatically control when it shows up and when we can hide it and and, and so on uh, let's look at the task board this is something i'm super uh, fond of just look how nice it looks right out of the gate and you can again make it whatever uh, style you want you can obviously do drag and drop Right? Everything works. Think about this on a touch uh, uh, kiosk as well. And if I go into theming, uh, this entire thing obviously supports all of our uh, themes. So if I uh, move the theme, everything just changes. Very right? Nice. So real nice, uh, a full Kanban board uh, for your WPF apps. Uh, the syntax editor, uh, again, I think I've showed you this last release, but again, take a look at some of the things we can do, just the highlighting. This is a, a SQL uh, query. Uh, here is uh, some JavaScript, here is some uh, uh, C-sharp, and here is some uh, XML. So for all of these things, we can define the language bindings and make sure the user gets a nice experience as he or she is typing so in. So this is super meta, Sam. If, can you click on the code tab? Yeah. So is this the syntax <laughs> <laughs> editor it, inside of? It is of? like Inception, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, maybe. Maybe we are using that. I'm not sure. Uh, but again, you, you get to see what we are what we are doing here, and yes, you can define those things. I think this is just using the Visual Studio once or whatever is baked into WPF. Uh, but if I go back here one more time, I want to show you uh, one other thing here. If I go into Configurator, 
uh, you can see if you want to write your code in uh, Comic Sans, go at it. We're not going to stop you. Font size. I am. Different types of palettes, we can do it all, uh, showing line numbers. And uh, if I go into taggers here, so this is what we use to kind of tag your things, and you can define uh, custom ones. So this one's on system. If I change it um, to, let's just say, Teleric, you can see how we change the highlighting of what you're typing in. So again, multiple edits all in one place, we, we can do it all. So this is really rich and, and, and full featured. All right, so that's with uh, WPF. Let me show you uh, WinForms real quick as well. Okay, here's the WinForms control. Uh, syntax editor, again, same exact experience, so I'm not going to show you that. Uh, again, it's very, very similar. Let me go in here so it kind of shows me a smaller view. Virtual keyboard here. First look. Okay, so this is the virtual keyboard, right? And out of the box, like I can start typing, uh, be it on my laptop or my physical keyboard as well as something else. If I go into uh, a different layout here, you can see I can have a QWERTY uh, extended keyboard or I can have a number pad. Again, this is completely compliant with all of our themes, just a virtual keyboard for any alternative uh, data inputs you might have. So yeah, this I'm would be excited. nice if, you, if you're building like, a, um, what are those things called, point of sales or yeah. something like that. Yeah. All right, I have a few more things to cover. Let's switch gears. Uh, uh, so you saw that. Uh, let's talk about UWP real quick. This is open source uh, for us. Again, if you're building universal Windows platform apps that run on every Windows device, uh, this is your uh, platform of choice. We want to give you uh, really uh, a rich featured control suite that gives you all of the UI that you're looking for, grids, uh, data visualization, scheduling, navigation, all of that. And this whole thing is open source, as you all know. Again, uh, the, this is some of it is community driven. We also take pull requests. We also put in some love. So again, if you're into UWP apps, uh, there's a UI suite to, to help you out. Uh, while we switch over from desktop to other things, just keep in mind that uh, desktop is not the same desktop as we did before. These are rich, modern, visually stunning apps that you're building. We would like to give you all of the tool sets out of the box so you can uh, build rich WPF and WinForms apps. Okay, uh, reporting. This is important because again, you're building enterprise apps and you need to be able to deliver your data and your charts and graphs however the user wants. Uh, so we have two things uh, that go in. Uh, there's obviously uh, Teleric reporting. Uh, so let me go into Teleric reporting here and what's new. Uh, something we did last release actually was a web-based report designer. So again, your users, you're giving them the option of setting up a report exactly the way they want. Uh, they don't have to come into Visual Studio. They can do it all inside of your web application. Uh, it's a designer widget that lets you really drag and drop and do it exactly how you, however you want to style it. It's a WYSIWYG editor, but this release, we are putting in some love to make sure you can hook it up to SQL data sources easily, and uh, we give you the connection string so you can pull data, uh, easy navigation, easy binding, and again, this really just works on every uh, type of web app. Uh, you can embed this inside of your web applications. Crystal reports, you remember those days? <laughs> yeah, that brings uh, back fond memories. Yes, so again, nothing wrong, but if you want to move off to something more modern, uh, we have had so, uh, a few iterations of this, but we are consolidating our Crystal reports uh, converter and more and more fields and properties and classes uh, that belong to Crystal reports now have direct mappings to Teleric reporting, uh, so you can bring them over. And you might like this, there is a report viewer now for Blazor. So yes. if you're building Blazor applications, you can embed a report viewer right there. It's HTML JavaScript, so be it uh, server-side or client-side, it'll work uh, just the way it's meant to be. So uh, it's simply a themes. Blazor component that yeah. you add to your Blazor application exactly. that has the connections exactly. that reach back into yeah. uh, the reporting system. Exactly. Uh, so you can do this uh, from wherever you want. And report server, this is our other pitch where you uh, it's one thing to be able to design reports. It's a whole other thing when you have a workflow of how you host your reports, how you deliver those reports on a, uh, through emails, or you want to have a schedule of times as to when they run. Again, the similar improvements that you see with uh, the report designer, they make, it, uh, make their way onto the report server as well. WYSIWYG design surface, uh, SQL data sources. Uh, we also made some changes into how you bind uh, property settings and how you edit them. So there is an expression editor, so you can do AND or uh, um, OR and other types of clauses as you're pulling data back uh, in your uh, report designer. Uh, so let me show you this real quickly, um, uh, if I can. So if you go into our reporting solutions here, this is all of our uh, the web 
interface that I talked about. If I go try it now here, you'll see this is this is just web. There is nothing else going on, and I can uh, pull back different types of components. And as I uh, as I click through, it shows you what it is that you're choosing. This is the data source, and again, connection string is right here. You can edit your select command. And this is just the data source. Beyond that, if I, I can also edit the parameters that go into report. These are all my styles. And as I go into them, they will show you which panel that you are, uh, you are messing with. So you can you really have control over exactly how you want the report to be. And we will highlight things. We will let you change things. And then it all pulls from a data source. So it's all built in for your users to be able to design the reports exactly the way uh, they want. So moving on to some more pieces as we close things out, we are also about developer productivity. We want to make sure we are giving you all the tools so you are successful. Most of you have already used Fiddler. Uh, I'll just quickly mention that Fiddler is there for all of your uh, Windows apps, ob obviously, to act as a network proxy. But we have also separated out the UI. So Fiddler Core now runs on .NET standard, which means we can make it run everywhere. You can embed this inside of your dashboard type applications. We also have Fiddler everywhere which is taking Fiddler to Mac and Linux. And this is still in beta, but give it a shot and, and, and see how it's working out for you. I use it quite a bit on my Mac, and it's, it's nice. And now you can fiddle on your Mac your Bing requests. <laughs> yes. Very cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, just mock. This is a mocking solution, uh, again, for you to write unit tests. Um, unit tests are important. It helps you have confidence as you are pushing out uh, updates to your app on a regular basis. Uh, your whole battery of unit tests can be driven by your mocking framework, and we try to give you all of those things out of the box, uh, different types of ways to mock various uh, programming interfaces and constructs. And again, it works with just about every uh, unit testing framework you can think of, NUnit, XUnit, mm -hmm. and, and then the build system, the integration is nice. So it's in Jenkins, it's in MS Build. Uh, and we also look into the CI CD pipeline. So some of the things we have done this release is Azure pipeline support. So if you're doing your builds and your CI CDs through Azure, we want to make sure we work with that. Uh, so all of your unit tests will start uh, uh, passing or failing based on how you have your tasks set up. Uh, we also have support for uh, running VS 2019 as a platform option if you're using Azure Pipelines. And again, a lot of code coverage uh, that you want to see inside of VS Code, we are bringing that code coverage uh, and indicators for all of your unit tests if you're using uh, JustMock. So uh, this is a very common pattern uh, in JustMocking. It's, it's called the AAA, so arrange, act, and assert mm -hmm. as you're writing up your uh, unit test cases. Within your IOC containers, we want to make sure that all of those patterns are maintained and we give you support so you're not having to do any hacks. So yeah. no matter what Visual Studio you're using, you should be comfortable. So one of the things we're looking at on the Blazor front is we've got this new full stack C Sharp platform. Um, it has unit testing capabilities you know, with X unit. We also can test unit test components now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have just mock, which is uh, a .NET uh, standard library. And then we have Test Studio. So yeah. we've got like this full range yeah. of things that we can apply exactly. uh, that we're looking into. And, and, and Test Studio works for developers and QA people. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can developers can do their thing, and QA people can automate tests, and you can have scripts uh, that uh, test your things out. So again, every release, you should have more and more confidence uh, if you have a battery of tests, and um, uh, both on a UI uh, standpoint and also unit testing. So you have confidence as you're pushing out uh, app updates. OK, uh, a few more things uh, that we do for developer workflows, just trying to make everybody uh, more successful. Again, we mostly talk about the UI side of things, uh, but there's other things we do. Uh, and Ed has already talked about Test Studio. Again, this is true for web, desktop, or mobile apps. Uh, this is true for every type of app that you can test. Uh, again, it's uh, liked by QA people and developers. Let me talk about a few other things uh, that we have been doing for years now, and some that are new. Sidefinity is obviously there. This is our CMS platform, mm -hmm. but uh, it's it's more of a digital uh, platform, and there are huge, huge websites built and run entirely on Sidefinity. So again, we don't talk about these things, but again, we do offer uh, CMS solutions and testing and reporting solutions. So we are covering the entire breadth of. Uh, the developer and workflow. it's a .NET technology as well. Absolutely. Now, this is something that's in beta yet, and hopefully uh, this is something we can um, bring to the market this year. Uh, this is something we have uh, talked about a lot. There is a, a little bit of a mindset gap between designers and developers, and we want to make sure we are trying to build a tool uh, that kind of bridges that gap. So Unite UX, this is something we're excited about. Uh, the goal is to have better round tripping between the developer and the designer. So this is a tool that you can play around with right now uh, as a beta. You can play, do it on Windows or Mac. Essentially, what we want to do 
is uh, bring those workflows a little closer. Your designers are likely doing their work on Sketch or Adobe XD. We want to give you a few templates, especially if you're designing web applications, Kendo UI templates so you can drag and drop and you can make your designs look almost as life-like uh, or real world as possible. And then we're going to use something of a meta bridge in between uh, to save off the design work and pull it up into a design studio, which is going to be your IDE. So if you're a developer, you can move things around, you can make things responsive. If you're a designer, you can kind of polish things up make it perfect and then we want to generate some code. Right now it's Angular and React and again we are trying to be very cautious in exactly what type of code we generate making it clean and again the developer gets to have full access to exactly how they build their app but this is where you can hook it up through some data sources see how your app uh, kind of looks like if you're, especially if you're building like a prototype. Before you actually start writing code this is your place to kind of make sure you have worked with your design team it's aligned to what you're trying to do and then you go off and work with whatever ID that you want. Mm -hmm. So again, this is experimental for now, but again, this is something we are hoping to bring uh, to you uh, fairly soon. Uh, like I said, it's Angular and React for now, but again, tell us if you're doing Vue or Blazor, we would like to bring that to those web applications as well. So this is something we are excited about. Again, just trying to bridge the developer designer mindset gap. So um, any other questions we can answer right now on air? I know we are running a little short of time. Um, there was a question about reporting. I'm not a reporting expert, uh, so hopefully I'm getting this right. Um, can you convert an SSRS report? SQL or can you reporting solutions? view yeah. it in the viewer? Yes, you can definitely view on the conversion. Um, I may have to kind of drill down into, because this gets complicated. So this mm -hmm. is where SQL Server lets you define some stuff. How do you bring it over? Um, again, let me get back to you, uh, and some of our engineers can as well. So as you write up the questions, we do have your contact information, and you can also write to us, you can ping us online, and we would like to kind of dig a little deeper to understand what exactly um, he or she is wanting to do and uh, try to get a better answer. Yeah. I think we're bumping up against time, so I think it's yeah. worth mentioning, uh, you know, we want to provide you guys with a value in coming in, in coming out to the webinar, and what you're not seeing on screen is the large group of people that are mm -hmm. working behind the scenes to answer questions we've got engineering, uh, product managers, you name it, mm -hmm. are all watching along with you yeah. and answering all of your questions and they're doing a fantastic job. Yeah, and every really is really, I mean, we are, I mean, you see us on video, but we really are standing on the shoulder of giants. Our mm -hmm. engineers, our QA people, our product owners, uh, our designers, everybody is focused on making sure developers are more productive on whichever stack uh, they pick and we want to give you everything out of the box so we can make your lives a little more simpler. So this is a Microsoft slide that I like throwing in. Uh, just think about the ammunition we have as developers to build amazing apps. So let's go change the world, right? Uh, with that, uh, this is the end for our uh, webinar here. Uh, we want to thank you immensely. We know everyone's busy and you're taking time off from your busy day to come and join us. If you had to drop off again, hopefully you're able to catch the recording. And uh, again, reach out to us for any questions you might have. But we're excited about the R1 release and starting off the decade strong. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts from you? Uh, Sam, change the world one Bing search <laughs> at a time, my friend. I will. All right, so that's it from us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again, and we will see you in the next release.